If we don't periodically disturb the ecology, it becomes a lethargic couch potato ecology. And so what we're doing here is ecological nurturing massage. <laughs> And that is the secret to carbon sequestration, cycling, and successional regeneration and freshening up of the ecology. Okay? All right. I mean, if you don't believe this whole disturbance thing, just think about it a minute. You know, having a baby is pretty disturbing. <laughs> but what kind of an innovative culture would we be if we didn't have any babies? See? See? You know, when, 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 when a principle spans spiritual, mental, emotional, ecological, economic truth, you know you've got truth. That's how you know you have truth. All right, so the pigs are building their ecology there through the disturbance. All of these plants, look at the diversity here. All of those are volunteer. They're in the seed bait. They're brought in on the wings of birds, on the flanks of deer, on the legs of possums. And this, this seed bank is allowed to germinate from the periodic disturbance to eventually create what I call my biological cathedral. This is 20 years of systematic poor sign disturbance followed by healing. Rest. When the pigs are done in the pig pastures, they go into the woods. And the forest needs the same thing. What we're trying to do is mimic what two million head of buffalo would have looked like when they marauded through the trees with their horns and their wallering and their hoof action being chased by wolves or Indians or fire. We don't have those anymore, so we've got to duplicate it. How do we do it? With pigs. Use a very simple little nylon cordage there as a poor boy insulator, zigzag it out around the trees, turn the pigs in. And these make three to five acre finishing paddocks on acorns and the pigs then go through, root out the brush and, and the, the, the starchy, the little high energy starchy woody species roots, freshen it up, stimulate the decomposition, stop the sterility of, of the undecomposed carbon, build soil, and eat the grubs out of the trunks of the trees that would attack the roots of the trees, and gradually thin out the, the trees and the forest ecology to grow forage and forbs and, and, and legumes as a, as a ground cover underneath the canopy of widely spaced trees so that we can get both tree growth, lumber growth, and forage growth at the same time. It's totally win-win and doubles the amount of carbon sequestration and solar energy we're capturing converting into biomass with the two tiers of plant life. Does that make sense? Okay. So, when the pigs are done finishing then, they just walk home. <laughs> it's like Michael Pollan said in Omnivore's Dilemma at Polyface all the animals have a wonderful life and just one bad day <laughs> well, this is an 800 pound mill run on a 20 horsepower Honda engine that puts us in the lumber business so that we can take these trees that are growing and value add them a thousand percent suddenly we have value in the forest suddenly the forest is worth stewarding See, that's the point here. Our county is building 800 houses a year. Not two of them uses lumber that's, that, that's cut within 2,000 miles of our county. And so the farmers just view the trees as something that gets in the way of the cows or the hay barn, so they destroy the woods. Nobody takes care of things. Nobody weeds them. Nobody cuts out the diseased trees. And so the NIPF land, the non-industrial private forest land, which accounts for 70% of the forest land in Virginia, only accounts for 30% of the harvest because it's so poorly stewarded. But if we go to localized infrastructure... And, and value at it so that we actually value at it on site, like next to where the trees grow, suddenly that value, all of that, that retail value at a, at, at a thousand percent more than the stump value all accrues into the local resource base. Suddenly, we've got enough value to fence out the woods, to weed the woodlot, to take out the diseased trees, to encourage good growth, to weed the forest garden, if you will. And so that becomes uh, a profit center for value-adding 
to the forks. Now, the branches we can all stab with the butts facing all one way, run through our chipper. Dad always called this our communist machine because it makes them all the same size. <laughs> and then that goes in the hay shed in the wintertime when we're in our dormant season and we're feeding hay. So the cows are dropping 50 pounds of material out their back end every day. And that material is highly soluble. If it gets wet, it wants to leach into the groundwater. If it gets dry, it wants to vaporize in the air because the soil is dormant. Um, the the gibberellins and the azotobacter and the, mica, uh, the, the mycorrhiza and the actinomycetes, you know, they're all sleeping. And uh, so they don't want to eat at that point. And so what we want to do is, is have a carbonaceous diaper under that volatile nutrient load to, 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 to pad it up. 50 pounds a day per cow, that's a big diaper, all right? And so the, so the cows, you can see the bedding build up there where the cows are, the haystack here, you just put it down there, and then you walk home and you read your San Mateo newsletter. It makes a wonderful quality of life, as opposed to the capital-intensive infrastructure which you see right here. This is much simpler. It doesn't make the front page of the uh, magazines, but the cows don't complain. It's fun. We're all about function, not form. All right, so we pay for carbon. That's our ultimate carbon credit. We pay for carbon. You know, I think it's, a, it's, it's immoral in our country that in the last 40 years, 80% of all the chips and the yard waste and the carbon generated has filled up our landfills instead of going back onto arable land to complete the carbon cycle. Instead, we've buried our carbon into anaerobic, uh, uh, non-decomposable, useless nothing, taken landfill space, and imported petroleum from the Middle East to compensate for the fertility drain. This is called mob stocking, herbivorous, solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization. <laughs> And if all the cattle in America were run this way, in fewer than 10 years, we would sequester all the carbon that's been emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. The herbivore perennial and, and, and prey predator relationship are what built all the great deep soils of the world. And so we look at that and we say, well, how was that done? Are there principles there that we can mimic? Because, let me admit right up front, cows have done a lot of damage. Do we agree? But you know what? The damage, don't blame the cow. And for those of you who think the cows are making methane, methane warming the globe, remember that 600 years ago there were way more herbivores in North America than there are today. Also remember that when a cow makes methane from that grass, it's exactly the same amount of methane that's emitted if the grass just decomposes and rots by itself. So all this, all this unused land out here that's just growing and dying and growing and dying, the same amount of methane is given off there as if you, can, if you put it through an herbivore. And if you put it through an herbivore, look at the advantage you've got. Milk or meat? Or both. And so we look at this and we say, well, so how does this relationship work? What are the principles here? There are three principles, and I have them nice, carefully alliterated so you can remember them. Number one, they're moving. When you look at the, the wildebeest on the Serengeti, the Cape Buffalo in Botswana, they're moving. They don't stay in the same place, do they? They follow weather patterns. They stay away from the flies. They're moving. Second thing is, they're not spread out all over the Serengeti. They're mobbed up. Who can tell me why? Safety. Safety. Thank you. Yes. Because the camera pans over into the edge of the bushes and there's a lion or a cheetah or a leopard, right? Okay. So they're mobbed up for protection and that mobbing does two things. It makes them walk very aggressively and carelessly across the landscape which shreds and chips the undecomposed and uneaten carbon into the soil surface where the soil biota can reach up and nibble on it and convert it into organic matter. And it makes them graze very aggressively so they don't have such a finicky selective appetite. See, cows like their ice cream better than liver and onions too. I don't know about you. I'm a very discriminatory ice cream eater. I only eat ice cream if I'm alone or with somebody. <laughs> the only time I eat it. Well, cows are the same way. And they always eat dessert first. And so these herbivores graze aggressively in the mob 
and so they graze less selectively and they eat a much wider variety of plants, they become equal opportunity plant munchers as opposed to discriminatory plant munchers. And I think most of us would like to have equal opportunity instead of discriminatory. Okay. Um, and then the third thing is they're mowing. They're not eating dead cows. You know, I think it's pretty amazing that the U.S. Duh, which took farmers like me for 40 years to Texas Steakhouse restaurants to give us free meals to show us the new science-based technology of feeding cow dead cows to cows, now 40 years later is trying to position itself as the repository of food safety. I mean, the outfit gave us mad cow, now they're trying to say, we want to protect you from it. It's pretty disingenuous. Uh, if you haven't figured it out, I don't have much regard for the U.S. duh. Anyway, all they've tried to do is put me out of business, so I just, yeah, forget it. Um, so, so what you've got here is mowing. They're not eating corn. They're not eating dead chickens and chicken manure like we're feeding in the Illinois Valley. Um, they're not feeding grain or silage. They're mowing. So... We've got mobbing, we've got moving, mobbing, mowing. All right, class, say it with me. Moving, mobbing, mowing. All right, you just made an A. All right, so all we're doing now is taking those three ideas, those natural things, like a template, like a boilerplate, and we're cutting out around it like a pattern. We're laying it down on a commercial domestic production model and saying how can we most closely approximate that. So that's what we do. Uh, we move these cows every day to a new spot using the high technology of electric, modern electric fencing. I'm not a Luddite, okay? Uh, we use technology, but we want to use technology that enhances and massages the natural principle, not just disrespect, adulterate, and prostitute the natural principle, but rather use it. So we move the cows every day to a new spot. It's very, very simple infrastructure. Again, lightweight, simple, gentle. I mean, if you're driving down the road, you can't even see. It's not like erecting a, you know, a big wooden uh, physical board fence. This is what you see. If you're driving 60 miles an hour, you don't even see these fences, all right? Very light footprint, gentle stuff. The cows become very docile and easy to move. You can, I mean, you can put a piece of baler twine down the side and they think it's electric fence. It's very, very simple. So we're making and unmaking paddocks every day. Now what happens in the dormant season? Would you have a drought like this in August or when it get, turns cold? All right, so we stockpile this forage ahead of them and here we are putting a hundred head in a quarter acre per day. So you can see here, that's what it looked like 24 hours ago. Here's what it looked like 24 hours later. Look at that accumulation of biomass. What this does is, since grass grows in a sigmoid curve, we're wanting to graze that grass up here after its blaze of growth, its juvenile growth period, because that is when it has most uh, uh, eff efficiently and efficaciously accumulated the greatest amount of biomass related to time. If you just leave those cows in there and they just keep that grass nipped short all the time, the grass never gets out of diaper stage. We want it to go through juvenile and catch it before it turns into nursing home grass. Okay? We want to catch it at, at, at midlife. All right? And, and when it has reached that physiological, uh, complete physiological potential. So those cows become that carbon converter. All right? Just to drive the point home, upper picture is Cape Buffalo and lions in Botswana, South Africa. Low picture is cows and electric fence in Swope, Virginia. See the biomimicry?